fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and I'm Al Warren, sitting at the controls, and uh, in the east coast of the country, (laughs) we have uh, David North Martino. Present. Yeah, see, I said it. I didn't didn't make fun of your name. You didn't this time. No, I've been bugging you all week. I miss it already. Yeah. Well, no, that's all right. We'll we'll make up for it. We will. Um, So, I I just noticed, I I noticed, hey... um, are you going to be on Cameo? I, I start selling yourself, or on ca- yes, yeah, I should do that. We should do that together. Yeah, we'll be the cheapest ones on there. Five. We bucks. will. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, um, so uh, now we have uh, an author on the line, and so we're, we'll just get right to her because this is uh, she is a New York Times bestseller, uh, and we're going to talk about a single light, and it's a thriller. And it's book two. Um, so, Tosca Lee, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Wow, Tosca. Mm-hmm. So, um, let's get into you first before we cover into the book. So, uh, how did you become a writer? Like, what was uh, what was mm-hmm. it that drew you to writing? Well, I, I didn't mean to. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I actually meant in my early life, I, I, my goal was to become a professional ballet dancer, and that was really important to me. Um, I grew up in Nebraska, which is where I am now, and at a young age, I danced with the Omaha Ballet, but I would go away to Kansas or New York or different places in the summer and dance, and so that was really my main goal growing up. Uh, until I I got an injury when I was a teenager, and it seemed like things might shift course a little bit because, you know, it's it's such a competitive, um, you know, art form. So, um, you know, I went off to college, and during this whole time, I'd written my entire life. I wrote as a young kid, and I used to win contests and, you know, do stuff like that and got published in little things, but I never really thought of writing as a thing. yeah, but so what? But what actually? You know, it's it's curious. So yeah. Um, after after you got hit on the knee by Nancy, Nancy <laughs> Kerrigan, right. I mean, holy cow! I, I would get on that too. I'll tell you, I was like, um, but 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 there has to be like, there's people that write. So it sounds like it, like you were mm. you were comfortable with writing. But yeah. what gives you the um, the nerve to actually go? <laughs> Well, and I, I don't mean that in aggressive way. Yeah, right, more, no, it takes nerve. It, it, it does. does. <laughs> that, what, 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 okay, confidence, that's the word. There sure, has to be yeah. something that you kind of The chutzpah, like, yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I loved reading. So, you know, I, I grew up in the 70s. We didn't have all these video games. We didn't have all this stuff, right? So yeah. our big escape, you know, beyond, you know, Fantasy Island and primetime TV and all that stuff was reading. And I loved books, and I loved reading. And... um it was it was when I had come home for spring break after my during my freshman year. Um, I'm the only person I know who goes home to Nebraska for spring break. <laughs> <laughs> I had come home and I was chatting with my dad, and I was chatting about one of my favorite books of all time, which is this um, older book now called *The Mists of Avalon*, and it's about the women behind King Arthur's throne. Um, fabulous book, and I was talking about how. Great books are are like roller coasters, you know, twists and turns and all these things. And I just blurted it out. I said, you know, I think I'd like to try to write a book of my own because the thought was, you know, maybe I could provide the same kind of roller coaster ride to somebody else as well. So my dad at the time said, okay, Tosk, I'll make you a deal. 
She said, I'll uh, pay you what you would have made working at the bank this summer. I was supposed to work as a teller for the second summer in a row, and I was a terrible bank teller. And, I mean, not good with numbers. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) And he said, I'll pay you what you would have made working at the bank if you will write your first novel, do it full-time like a job, and, um, you know, do it eight hours a day and and do it full-time this summer. And I said, deal. So I wrote my first novel that summer, and it was really bad. <laughs> it was pretty terrible. <laughs> but, you know, that's how I started. And it, it started from a love, love of reading. Well, you know, that would have fit in the 70s, you know, Disco, Love Boat, Fantasy <laughs> Island, and a really bad novel. It could have sold. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> right? That would have fit that's right true. in. That's true. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so, so now, so you move on, and you're writing, and, and you've been... Mm-hmm. Pretty successful, it looks like. Obviously, you've been doing mm-hmm. well. Um, what's 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 the biggest um, thrill you get out of this now when you look you back know, at it? I really like entertaining people. I mean, at, at first, there's always the thrill of I got an agent or I got published or I'm now with Simon and Schuster and that's really cool or you know somebody's asked to option this or whatever and that's very fun you know that's always exciting though you know you can die of optimism while you're waiting to ever have yeah. anything made into a movie or something <laughs> but you know the the really cool thing for me now is um and i've been writing full time uh for about a decade now actually um it's just when people say you know what this got me through this tough time in my life so I was in the hospital or I was going through a divorce. I was taking care of, you know, aging parents or, you know, whatever. And this is why this book of yours meant a lot to me. And I really love that. Right. So so you, you like interacting with your readers and you like that they're... Um, I do. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the like, the, the candy part of this job for me. And um, that's something that's been really hard for me to not have this last year because I really love getting out and seeing readers face to face. I'm a hugger, you know, and that's like, <laughs> can't hug anybody anymore. <laughs> you know? It's like, forget it. <laughs> yeah. So that's, I'm, I miss that a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, so how does, how do, how does, how do you deal with, the world being so social media orientated now that's mm. something that's we're, we're, you're not used to in the 70s mm. um, both you and Dave are from that time period I'm even older Absolutely. so I, I'm I'm grandpa here <laughs> but so so this whole social media thing and where every time you do something or put something out or there's something like that there's like a million people that can comment on on mm. any little thing right and mm-hmm. um, how does that affect you and does it stop you from interacting with with your list readers um no i mean in general i enjoy it and I, I think i'm fortunate in that i in general i i try to stay up on it as much as i can but that said every now and then i post something and i you know have a little moment of anxiety or what will people <laughs> think of this or how's this going to come back on me or you know whatever um so yeah. i it's really a two-edged sword, and, I, and I'm disappointed a lot by the fact that, you know, because it is kind of anonymous in, in many ways that people feel they can drop their filters and be rude and things like that. I, I don't care for that. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, that's, it's, it's just sort of the way society's gone, so it's kind of something you, you kind of have to get a tougher skin, I guess, right? A little yeah. Bit more of a, of a front. Yeah. Um, so now you... Um, write fiction now so this this last uh, the last series these last two books mm-hmm. um now i guess they're kind of considered uh, a medical thriller mm-hmm. um or action thriller i'm kind of not sure where it's kind of a mm-hmm. on that sort of thing now yeah. it also is centered <laughs> on on kind of a you know a pandemic and and all that sort of stuff um, yeah I'm sorry. No, but what timing? I mean, <laughs> what timing? Um, it's, it's that sort of, well, what got you into that? Because this was done yeah. before the real pandemic hit. So yeah. what, what kind of um, lit the fire for this one? Well, you know, I had, uh, a few years ago, I had seen this article about um, this um, it's Siberian village that um, a, a reindeer carcass had thawed in the melting permafrost. 
and it happened to be infected with anthrax, and it made this, this neighboring village sick, and a young boy died. And I remember thinking, wow, that's really scary. And when I was reading this article, these other related articles popped up kind of to go with it, and you know, things like these seeds that are, you know, 30,000 years old that have been germinated by scientists into these flowers and um, scientists being cautious and wary at best and downright, you know, concerned at worst about things that might be coming out of the melting permafrost. And I just thought that was really fascinating. And having stories about diseases that come out of the permafrost is not a, a unique thing. There's been stories like that before. Um, but I thought it'd be kind of fun to delve into that. I do like disaster stories. I do like, um, you know, kind of not just pandemics, but disaster type stories. I like run for your life stories. So I, I don't know why, but yeah. <laughs> so I took this idea with me to, uh, in a short list of favorite ideas to my publisher, um, in New York for a meeting to talk about what was next. And, that my publisher pointed to this one, which I was really enthusiastic about, and also this other idea about a young woman starting over after leaving a doomsday cult that she'd grown up in her entire life and having to start over in the outside world. And he said, I like this one and this one. I think you should put them together. And I remember thinking, what are you on? <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> but um, I said, okay, I'll, I'll give it a go. And I came home and started working on it and that became the line between in a single light. Do you think um, these, these two books have crossover appeal for both people who enjoy uh, medical thrillers and science fiction? Yeah, I think so. Um, it, they, they have been categorized in the medical thriller uh, genre. Um, it is about a pandemic. Um, a single light has won awards in the science fiction category. So um, they definitely encompass several different genres, the medical genre, thrillers, you know, disaster, dystopian, all that kind of thing. So. What got, what got mm -hmm. you down that? Like why, so um, disaster and sort of, uh, <laughs> like what, is, is this sort of, um, do we need to bring in our psychiatrist? Here? Yeah, probably. <laughs> is, is it free? <laughs> yeah. It's free. No, I just, it's curious because um, I always like trying to figure out a fiction author and sort of where mm -hmm. they get their ideas from and what what gets them into it but you seem to be focused <laughs> on this this disaster sort of this this fight yeah. well you know there's a couple things i mean i i think um i find things like doomsday bunkers which you know you for a cool million or two you can get a really nice one actually you can go buy these things i'm in one um, you're in one okay <laughs> 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 do you have a pool <laughs> I do. <laughs> Some of them do, you know. It's like, so I'm, I'm really into studying and learning about these kinds of things. The cult thing is really interesting. Um, but I think under normal circumstances, the, the appeal of disaster novels or movies or any of that is that, you know, it takes all the noise of everyday life and boils it down. And, you know, things have become very simple. It's just about survival for yourself and the people you love. So... Mm. It's a very singular kind of focus, and all this other stuff kind of fades away. You know, yeah, because I, I, I see, because I've, I've had twenty books published, all in nonfiction. I have covered cults a lot, mm -hmm. and doomsday cults, and I've um, even been on a documentary. So I understand that. But why? Is, so you take these kind of stories, but you make it fictionalized, like you take. So your characters mm. are created and the whole thing. Why right. not go for the real thing? Or do you want to stay away from that? Um, you know, I, I specialize in fiction. So, you know, I like being able to control the story. I like to craft the arc. I like to, you know, create very specific outcomes. And so, you know, that's how fiction is, is different um, than real life. Real life is stranger um, than fiction, for sure. Yeah. But um, it's fun to to research things like cults or, you know, all these different things and to distill it down and to create these scenarios where you put these poor characters in these tough situations and, and then, you know, make it worse. I don't know why that's fun, but it kind of is. <laughs> yeah, uh, dominatrix, isn't that what <laughs> <laughs> More like torture chamber, you know, yeah. supervisor. <laughs> well, does it, so, but does that kind of, um, does that sort of um, 
do you have that history? Do you like the old idea of like the old Vincent Price movies and stuff like that, and 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 Edgar Allan Poe and all that sort of thing? Or I do. Just, I yeah. I like all different kinds of stories. Though I mean, I I also enjoy romance. I also enjoy you know time travel and um, yeah, science fiction as well. I mean, I. I, I really enjoy a lot of different things. And I think that kind of bugs my agent because <laughs> I'm like, no, I'd like to write this. And he's like, seriously? <laughs> Could you yeah. be more all over the board? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you don't want to eat the same thing every day, right? You don't want to read the same thing every day. You, I don't want to write the same thing every day. So, you know? Well, on that note also, you've also mm -hmm. written uh, some historical fiction. Yes. Uh, like the Queen of Sheba mm -hmm. and um, uh, Judas Iscariot, mm -hmm. and you're writing in uh, first uh, the first po person point of view. Yeah. How do you get into the mind of a historical mm -hmm. character like that? Well, you know, at first you kind of have to tell yourself, okay, I am a uh, first century Jewish man, you know, or whatever. <laughs> you have to you have to kind of tell yourself that, but. It's, it's weird because, uh, in a sense, it, it becomes more like you're just uh, role-playing after a while, and then very shortly after that, you're not role-playing anymore because the human experience is, is not that different, you know, from person mm. to person and throughout history. So, in a lot of ways, you know, no matter whose story you're telling it or how fictionalized it is, you're still telling your own story. You know, you're telling the story of humanity and people. So, um, yeah. it's not that hard, actually. Yeah. Hmm. So I found that when I was writing the story of Judas Iscariot, you know, I would tell myself I'm a first century Jewish man. But, you know, halfway through, I realized I was very much writing my own story because I was writing the story of someone um, who was disillusioned with the way that he perceived God to be working in his life, which many people have felt that. And, you know, things weren't going the way he thought they should. And that's been all of us. So. Hmm. Yeah. Now, in in your book, um, in your newest book, um, you have uh, your main characters, Winter and Chase. Mm -hmm. Who are they? Yeah, so Winter's a gal who grew up in this doomsday cult in Iowa, and not a real cult, but, you know, a fictional one, and she is ousted at the beginning of the book, and she's 24, she has OCD, and... Um, she and a little bit of PTSD probably, and she's starting over in this secular world that she's been taught to regard as evil. And she's doing it, um, she's going to become the, the hero of the, the books, but she's at a real disadvantage because she's led such a sheltered life. She doesn't even know how to work like a TV, you know, remote control or a smartphone or, you know, drive a car or many of these other things that we take for granted. Um, and then Chase is a, a love interest in the book, and, um, you know, he's. He's former military, and he's also trying to find his way um, in the world as well, you know, after starting over, too. So their circumstances are different, but also very similar in many ways. It, 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 so how do you create a character like Winter? Like, where does that come from for you? Mm -hmm. Well, she was named after my stepdaughter, whose name is Winter, spelled the same with a Y, um, who was the same age when I started this book, and she is a big reader, so... I did that thinking of her, um, but you know, I, I really, I don't put a lot of thought into it. I, I think a little bit about their circumstances and what would go into making them the way they are. And then I go in and I just start to write. And if I feel like I don't know them well enough, I take time and I journal um, as that character in first person, you know, like I'm writing a diary for them. Um, but yeah. Do you hear voices like in that. your head? <laughs> well, how did that. you know? <laughs> well, because there's a, well, Dave. That's how he writes. But there's uh, yep. there's a lot of fiction writers that do that. They'll they they get it kind of the 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 voice way. They kind of mm -hmm. uh, and others are visionary. So I, I, it sounds like so. Mm -hmm. I, I just that's why I sort of why you <laughs> is it like do do they speak to you? I feel like you're. It's it's not like they speak to me, but I feel like I'm just kind of taking it down because. I really liken it a lot as um, role playing almost because, or acting, because all of a sudden you, you kind of become that character. Um, it feels like acting to me, or like you're taking dictation almost, something like that. Yeah. How much of you do you put into that character? Oh, you know, there's always a little bit. Um, 
I put my humor in. I put, um, I, I also have OCD. So that's something that I included for her and that there's some of my experience with it there. Um, you know, I, I did grow up with a very strict religious upbringing, um, not, not to the extent that Winter did in the story, of course, but, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's these little things from our own lives that you take and you kind of blow them out and make them bigger and exaggerate them. And, you know, but you've got these little seeds from your life that you can draw from. So, yeah. Does, but how does that, uh, I mean, because like, in a sense, what you're doing is you're kind of being, um, you're exposing things about your own personal life, your own personal mm -hmm. feelings. And at the same time, you're kind of putting it up, down on paper. Mm -hmm. So if someone reads it, so you're kind of being vulnerable to your readers in a sense. Is that sort of ever, mm -hmm. does, that, that must take a certain amount of confidence as well. Well, yeah, some of it, you know, not everybody would be able to read it though and say, I, I know this is true for her or not. So, but yeah, there is, there is that. And I think the more, um, the more vulnerable you can be as far as what it, maybe not the specific situations, because you know, the situations that the characters are going through are, may not be the same as what I have, but I've certainly experienced things like betrayal or, you know, hopes or loss or, you know, different things like that. And, and so I just kind of funnel those same experiences and feelings into different situations. And so I try to keep them as visceral and, you know, as true to feeling as, as they have been for me. Um, and that's mm. kind of how I inform my, my character writing. Mm. Yeah. And, and, then, and then Chase, so when you've got a male mm -hmm. character like that, um, where do you get your inspiration to do the male? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, we want my names? <laughs> yeah, we want names, <laughs> phone numbers, addresses, we want it all. Uh, my husband, actually. My, my husband is... Um, you know, I steal little things that he's done or said that I, as a woman, really like. And um, and it's it's kind of funny because then people say, oh, gosh, I just love Chase so much. Or I love Luca from this other duology I did so much. And, and, I'm, and I just kind of smile. Yeah, <laughs> keep your hands off. <laughs> I even had a male editor once. I put in, my husband's name is Brian. I put a Brianism in there. And I had a male editor say once, oh, please, no man would ever say that. <laughs> And I was like, oh, but, you know, he did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. You never know. You never know. Uh, so what is it you want someone to get out of the book, like besides the story itself? You know, someone takes home and, and, and reads this book and that. Is there something you want them to take away from it? Mm. Yeah, well, first of all, I just want them to be entertained. I mean, yes, I, I do hope that, especially with things like uh, my historical stuff, you know, that you know, they must be interested in that period or they probably wouldn't have picked up the book. So I do hope that they may learn something new. But, you know, if we only wanted to learn, we'd all be reading nonfiction. So, you know, we go to fiction to be transported and to step away from this life into a different adventure. And, and that's what I'm hoping to provide is that roller coaster ride for them. Wow. Mm -hmm. um that's it, it, it's kind of a whole interesting concept. So, what made you go mm -hmm. into this um, uh, pandemic? <laughs> yeah, I just once again it was kind of that disaster thing. But also, I have the advantage of having a sister who's a physician and also teaches med school. So she was able to help me kind of design the disease, which is based on a real disease, a prion disease, but the way that it's done in the book is not something that has happened in the world yet that we know of. So um, so she kind of helped me design that. And, you know, it's just, dare I say, fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when the stakes are high, you know, like you, you could get sick and you could, you know, prion diseases are always fatal. Um, you, you can't. There, there's no recovery from them, so that raises the stakes, and um, it's, it makes it more, more fun, more dangerous. Uh, 10,000 words, one day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like the Mile High Club for Writers. Right, I like. I yeah. Know, have you written 10,000 words in a day or over? I find that that's mm -hmm. rare for me, but um, it, it, is that something that you do? 
I, I do. Um, the reason that I, I kind of that I have this T-shirt and that I, I push writers sometimes to really go for those big word days. My biggest word day I think was fourteen thousand words, which was that'll wow. wipe you out for a while. Yes. Yeah. But you know the reason why I do you know encourage people to have days like that. They don't have to be that big. They could be five thousand. You know, four, whatever. Um, is because it, you're not editing as you go and you're not worried about it and you're not overthinking it. And sure, you can come back and you can cut half those words out and, you know, some of it's going to be trash. And, you know, but there might be some really beautiful gems in there. And um, you're, you're not censoring yourself and you're writing with full audacity. And, you know, that's when you write best, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. I would know. I, I. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that I, I have not had days quite that big since turning, you know, 50. It's gotten harder, you know. <laughs> it's gotten hard. It takes more out of <laughs> The older I get, I'm like, oh, gosh. I got the feeling. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Lucky to yeah. wake up at 50. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, <all> right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a struggle just to be alive. Um, yeah. <laughs> I used to write all night long, and now it's like 10 o'clock. Oh, I don't know. I think I might go lay in bed for a while. So. <laughs> it gets worse. It gets worse because when you're Wait. 60, 10 o'clock, God, 10 o'clock. <laughs> I haven't seen 10 in, in I don't know how long. It's like 9. I'm 8.30. I'm looking at the dog. And it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> this is too late. Um, do you ever worry? Because like when you're when when, so when you did the books and the book comes out now and then this pandemic hits, does it <laughs> does it sort of do you worry about backlash or do you, has it hurt sales or well, how how do people react to this? Because it's going on kind of in a different yeah, way. Yeah, I really worried that um, people would be like, okay, I really don't want to read about this right now, and that has certainly happened. Though a weird thing happened at the start of the pandemic, which was pandemic fiction actually had an uptick. Um, so did movies like Outbreak and uh, Contagion. <laughs> so why that is, I don't know. But um, I did worry about that. We d uh, Those two books are or ha were in development for, for television, but that got put on the back burner because nobody wants to do that right now, you know. So. Yeah, especially if, it, especially if it's very real, like, you know. It, it's, it's still going on, right? Yeah, so yeah, it's kind of yeah. like too soon. So, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, I was, I was worried about it, though. Those two books have been my most um, o o decorated books as far as awards um, of any of my books. So um, there how was does, that. <laughs> yeah, but how does that, does that, how does that make you feel then when something like that happens? Um, does it hmm. kind of does it change how you feel about writing and how you feel about these books? The awards? Yeah. Um, no, it just it feels like a a nice gratifying thing. Like okay, you know that's that's nice. I don't put them out. I don't have them in my office. I don't you know they all go in a box um, because I don't believe in you know like leaning on those. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. but it is always a nice feeling to have someone say okay, especially because um, you know I kind of had. You know, you have to keep your confidence up when you're writing as an author. You have to, you know, when you're writing fiction, you have to go into it with a certain level of, of not just courage, but confidence. You know, you're the god of that world right now. So, um, and I, my confidence was kind of wavering as I wrote the first book, especially when I had to rewrite it a few more times than normal to get it to work. And so um, to have the book be recognized after really struggling with it felt, felt good. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. How do you think it's changed you? Um, you know, I think I, I think that the thing that really has changed me the most and really sunk in the most was the struggle with the book because, um, you know, I was experimenting with the way that I, I go into planning books. You know, some people are pantsers. They, they write by the seat of their pants, and some people are plotters, and I've always had to have some kind of outline and, and it just reinforced for me that I have to stay true to the, the way that I work best, which is I need some kind of outline, and I've tried to go into it kind of half-cocked, which is not good. And um, so it was just kind of a good reinforcement and learning thing for me. Um, and it really helped me as I went into the second book, which flew by. And, you know, after str you can struggle and you can kind of lose the fun of it, but 
going into the second book, A Single Light, um, there's nothing better than writing and just losing track of time or giggling maniacally every now and then. <laughs> you know, it's like there's no, because we we read for fun and you have to have fun while you're writing too. Otherwise, why do it? You know, it's too yeah. hard. <laughs> oh yeah, oh for sure. <laughs> Did you ever look back at any of your books now, um, especially the earlier ones, and kind of think you would do them differently? Mm. Um, sometimes, but you know. If, for me, even with fiction, it's each book feels like a snapshot of that period in my life of how my style was then and what I was interested in then. And, you know, I've had the chance to go through and edit some of my with new editions that came out with different publishers as the rights have changed hands. But, um, no, I, 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 you know, for me, the temptation to pick and redo is already so great just because that's my personality. So I think it's good to kind of be at peace and be like, okay, that was then, and now it's time to, you know, do this new thing and mm. try something new. Yeah. 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 It's, 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 it's a pretty interesting process. Mm -hmm. And I think it evolves too, you know, for, for any kind of, creative person. I, I think you're always evolving your style or your process or your your philosophy about how you do it. You know? And speaking of that, you um, you also wrote a series with another author. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering how is how was that process, you know, working mm -hmm. with another writer to to create a series? Mm hmm Well, you know, it's long. Um, we both agreed that after, as we were writing the first book, which took an incredible amount of time, I mean, you know, we plotted it very quickly, we wrote it very quickly, but, you know, it still takes so much time to talk through it. Um, you know, we could have each written that book on our own much faster. But mm. then you lose the benefit of why you, why you write with somebody else, which is to draw on each other's strengths. So, um, and I know a lot of people who, who write with partners, and as far as I can tell, everybody's process is different. And our process was different even from book to book. So one book, uh, I would take the lead on the rough draft, and he would rewrite it, and I'd go through and write it over, and he'd rewrite it. And we were looking for that, that single voice, that blended voice, uh, narrative voice. And then uh, another book, he would you know take the lead on the first draft, and I would go in and rewrite it just to get my fingerprints all over it too. So, And the, you know the third book flew by. We did it in two or three months. So... Yeah. Um, oh, you get who, your process down, you know. Who is the boss? <laughs> well, you know, he he has the bigger name. So oh, I was writing with Ted Decker. He has a far bigger name. He's the one who went and got the contract and stuff. So, you know, there was one point I remember. <laughs> we had talked to, this is what's going to happen coming up and all this. And I remember I was writing this chapter. I was still writing really late at night at that time. And uh, it just seemed right to kill this one character off, you know. It was like, you know, I just realized yeah. this is his time to go. And I killed him off. <laughs> and Ted called me the next day, and he's like, wait a second, you just killed this character. And I was like, it was his time to go. Let him go, man. Let him go. <laughs> and he was like, no. And so we ended up having to compromise because, you know, that was not part of his vision. And we did find a good compromise. but So you have killed him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have killed him, yep. <laughs> lost, lost his arm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, that's that's it's kind of interesting, but when you get into your characters like that, um, mm -hmm. so when you write with someone else, because some other teams that we've talked to um, had each taken on certain characters, wrote mm -hmm. the characters, and then combined it that way. Yeah. So we did do some of that later on. Um, you know, the first the first novel is such a learning process as far as what it's like working with the other author. You have to learn to trust them. You have to, you know, kind of get a feel for how they're going to approach this aspect or that of writing. So in our second and third books, there would be times where it'd be like, okay, I'm going to write this chapter with this character, and you write this chapter with that character. And I remember, you know, he was like, I'm going to go write this, um, you know, revelation scene in the desert, and you go write the, the war. And I'm like, I hate writing the war. You know, why do I always like, have you, you know, you write war because it's so much choreography, and it's wars and kissing scenes. Those are the worst. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> just, just go right to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah. <laughs> wow. I, I, I just, but it's, it must be hard in a sense. Because what if you get with a writer that can't write? 
Well, you have to choose your partners carefully. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that would be like being on a, a set of a studio, and then you're you're with mm. some actor that just doesn't really have it, you know. Yeah. But yeah. you know. Yeah. I'm just being. Yeah. Honest. Yeah. <laughs> Don't just, be a weenie. <laughs> no, I'm just being a weenie. I'm just being that way. So, what, what would your advice be to, to a, a newer writer, someone that's that's hasn't published but they've been writing, and they don't know what to do, or they what, what's the best advice you can give to someone that's new to this? Hmm. Well, you know, keep keep reading a lot so that you know. You know, so that it, study as you're reading, so you're picking up what's really working well. I mean, study your favorite books that made you want to do this, and find out what what is it about this book that's so great that just enthralled me. Um, so keep reading, keep studying, and then keep writing. And you know, you you really have to be tenacious um, as a writer, and you you can't give up. Um, and to get that authenticity down, I you know I always say write like no one's ever going to read it, even though that may go against the idea of wanting to get published. But um, I think when we write that way, that we are getting the good stuff down without worrying about what people will think. And that's when the best stuff comes out. So write like no one will ever read it. And then um, I always say get the clay on the wheel. So basically just don't, don't stop and pick. You know, just get it all done and go pick at it later. But if you don't finish it, you're never gonna, you're never going to get published. Right. So, so the story itself is probably the most important. Get, getting mm. the words out, getting out, getting out the real feelings or yeah. emotions. Get the story. The, yeah. Get the the story, the characters, all that, all that good stuff. Because you know that's in fiction. That's what we are going. We're going to be inspired by these characters, and we're going so we can escape to these other places or times or whatever it is. Um, and craft is important, but. In fiction, it's the story that's that is the most important thing because that's what transports us. So, make sure your story is enthralling and your characters are three dimensional and and as flawed and as strange as real humans are in real life. <laughs> yeah. All these normal people we live around. <laughs> <laughs> now, now the the scene the scene that you're writing in, or the let's say the city or the place that you're writing about when you write, mm -hmm. um, how, how intense do you write that scene? Is is it as important as the character, or do you even write it like a character, or is it something different to you? I think it just depends on the scene. You know, um, I do think that setting can be a character of its own. And I, I think the way that you're going to delve into it depends entirely on the scene you're writing, what your characters are feeling, you know, how you how you how you're feeling is your entire lens when you look out on the world, right? So, um, and also the genre, the genre will will play into it too. So if you're writing some southern gothic thing or some science fiction thing, you know, that determines too how much you're going to focus on it. You know, so when you get into a medical thriller like this, um, mm -hmm. how, the research must be the hardest, especially because when you're dealing with medical things, like, you're, you know, you're dealing mm -hmm. with some sort of disease or pandemic or some sort of virus or anything like this, you mm -hmm. kind of have to be um, realistic, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I had many conversations with my sister, and I was like, walk me through this again. How does this, how does this disease be? You know, how is this a zoonotic disease? How, so it jumped from animals to humans. So walk me through how this happened because I have to explain it in the book and it has to be plausible. And these things do happen. So it's, it's, you're kind of explaining what happens in everyday life as well. But you have to really understand this stuff and digest it well and then explain it in a way that makes sense. So, um, Boy, I don't know how many times she walked me through this whole thing. <laughs> she had to like drop charts, and <laughs> I, I, I'm like, I'm really sorry that I'm kind of, you know, I'm not picking this up real fast. But you know, I, I got to get it right, <laughs> and you yeah. have to get it right because you know you're going to have in this in this instance, I'm going to have doctors who will read this in your downtime, and I have. And when I write about Judas Iscariot, I have historians and I have pastors who read this stuff and who have been studying all this stuff. For you know, decades of their life, so I, it's really important to me to to get the research right. Yeah, I would imagine because it would lose its sort of 
Oh, yeah. You know, and if someone knows and if it's really kind of not very realistic, it kind of loses its straw, right? Completely, yeah. It just yanks you out of that um, suspension of disbelief that, that fiction is so dependent upon. And, you know, and I also have my pride, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, come on, I don't want to, and, you know. And maybe that's where the OCD is helpful, you know, because I, I am a real nitpicker about things. And so um, I, I have been known for my research, especially in my historical novels. And, yeah. and I, I take pride in that. How long does it take you to put together something like this? Um, well, this one, I, you know, I spent a few months researching it, and it took me about four months to write each book. Um, my novel about Judas Iscariot, I researched full time for a year and a half. I went to Israel. I recruited experts, you know, um, historians and theologians and all these different people. And I wrote it. Um, oh, I wrote it really hard for about six months, but it was all in all about a five year process. So um, the historical ones take me longer, but but they're fun. They're you know, it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. 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 You know, the research and all the timing and stuff like that. So. But it's fascinating. And you find, you know, as you research even these past, you know, times and all that, you find that people really don't change and human nature remains the same. Right. So it's just the setting. Yeah. You know? So do you have anti-maskers then in your book? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not see that coming or the toilet paper thing. It, you know, well, like, nobody I watched that. this unfold and I was like, what? Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. You know, that's, well, I think that's the thing, but that's the key because you can, you see the way people actually react mm. and act in these situations and it's always off the wall. It's so, way weirder than what you can make up. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Way weirder, yeah. Yeah, because if you wrote it in there, if you were writing about the toilet paper and all this, or you go, and then someone, someone <laughs> people reading like, it. What? No. Yeah, people, someone reading would go, no, well, that ain't going to happen. No it's way. It's as this, right? Yeah. Uh, no, then, like, I had people lined up outside stores, and I had people, you know, hoarding water and supplies like that, and looking for the va a vaccine later on, and wearing their masks and gloves and things like that, but... Um, I did not have the anti-maskers or vaxxers. Scott Sigler is an author who has a pandemic book, and he did um, have anti-vaxxers um, in his his pandemic book, which was um, a few years ago. Yeah. So, yeah, who knew? <laughs> well, well yeah. you don't you don't know you don't know how you know and the whole idea the whole conspiracy and all this stuff, right? The politis um, the way it's been politicized. I mean, who could have guessed? Yeah, because it's it's. <laughs> You know, it's it's a political thing and it's not, you know, but they make yeah. it. It's, it's crazy in a sense. Because, it has been. You know, it, how do you deal with that, right? And, and that's a tough thing to write about because if you do put something like that in your book, you'll get labeled, right? You know, mm -hmm. a, a something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was every now and then I, you know, I try to avoid a lot of that stuff. And even on my social media, I avoid a lot of political stuff and all that, you know. But during the pandemic in the book, Canada built a wall to keep the Americans out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was part of that. All was... these things. I thought, you know what, this is kind of funny. And, you know, the Port <laughs> Puerto Rico was the only place that had electricity in the book, which I thought was, you know, great. So, you know, every now and then you get your little... Yeah. snarky moments <laughs> well you know and I, I was down there helping them build the wall i i'm i'm across the border right now i've been up here for a year so mm -hmm. you're just trying to keep me out yeah that's it <laughs> <laughs> keeping everybody out no none no more of this stuff <laughs> wow <laughs> it's pretty interesting now do you have a website and a place that you want people to come and send you dirty letters and <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, so, the um, to send the dirty letters to <laughs> Alan. Uh, no, just to, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I'll forward them. Dave Roth Martino. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, my, my website is toscalee.com, so it's just T-O-S-C-A-L-E-E.com. And I'm on social media as Tosca Lee on Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and Instagram and all those. So. Yeah, all those fun sites, <laughs> all those places. <laughs> Yeah, wow. but my dog is more popular than I am everywhere, oh. so. <laughs> yeah. Dogs are the best. Yeah, they are. Nothing better. Hopefully the dogs lived in your book. 
Oh, yeah. I, and I do have a dog in my book. Oh, yeah, so, of course. Yeah. They, they have to. You gotta have a dog. To... And you can't kill the dog. No. You, you never kill the dog. <laughs> it's just like the cardinal sin. Oh, so. I know. You know, and actually it's true because in my later days here now, whenever I'm watching something and if the dog gets killed, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know, yeah. I'm over. Uh, yeah. ne next. Flip the channel. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. Which yeah. is really weird because that never bothered me before. In this last, mm -mm. I'd say about five, ten years, I've been real sensitive to that. Yeah. Well, you can like kill the most lovable character in something, and and that's a bummer. But no, you can't kill the dog. No, there's something uh, something just wrong. Yeah. Sick yeah. and wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's a spoken and unspoken rule. <laughs> so what's next for for Tosca Lee? What's next? Mm. Um, I'm writing uh, with a co-author right now, a different co-author, and we're writing a story about the Bataan Death March in the Philippines. So it is a novel, um, but it is inspired by uh, true accounts. So it's the story of three teenage boys who go off to the Philippines. Um, they enlist right before Pearl Harbor happens and end up caught up in the war, and they become prisoners of war for almost four years. So. Um, mm -hmm. Heavy stuff, but important, an important yeah. story, yeah. So you're writing with an author that'll listen to you now, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, not, you're not taking any. You're the I'm boss. not covertly killing people anymore. I've moved no. beyond that. <laughs> no. well, that I've good. grown up. <laughs> has, has, well, has this, you know, when you're writing, mm -hmm. like during this pandemic, you know, with all that dark stuff sitting around mm -hmm. you and, 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 you know, any time you turn on the news, there's something else uh, crazy going on, right? It's either a shooting or Donald Trump playing golf or something, right? Uh, Some sort of crazy stuff. Yeah. And, um, but with that going on outside your door, does that sort of seep into your writing, do you think? You know, I don't know if it seeps into my writing, but it has drastically affected my creativity. And last year, I kept beating myself up saying, what is my problem? Why am I not getting all this work done? Well, all the kids, you know, we have three boys, teenagers at the time, um, who are still at home. And they all came home from school. They were all cooped up at home. We had just torn up the house for a renovation. We literally had a toilet sitting in the middle of the basement. You know, so the house is torn up, one working bathroom, all the kids home. Oh, wow. And I don't have an office right now. I've been working out of the bedroom. And it's like, why am I not getting work done while this heavy stuff, like you said, is happening in the world? And when you're taking on a heavy topic like a war, um, you know, and characters who are prisoners of war and things like that, it's been rough. And yeah. I know people who have done a lot and flourished and gotten a lot done and gotten in the best shape of their life. I hate them. I don't yeah. understand. Oh, yeah, yeah. What's wrong with these people? Why kill can't kill they, them off in your next book. Why can't they be gaining 20 pounds like the rest of us and, you know, yeah. moping around and eating Cheez-Its, you know, so. Yeah. Well, you got to kill them yeah. off in the next book, right? You oh, I will. Start, ta start <laughs> taking names. <laughs> I wrote a short story a couple months ago, and I killed quite a few people off. It was very therapeutic. Yeah, so. I bet. I bet. <laughs> I, you know, I've heard that. I've heard that. We've, we've had authors on that, that kill people that they don't like or people that are, you know, someone cuts them off in the line. Mm -hmm. They make them a character. And they, or it kind of reminds them of people they don't like. And yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's mm -hmm. the best in the world. I, don't I think know. it's kind of neat myself. But. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just remember not to, not, uh, I'm a nice guy. Get, kill off David. He's just uh, Alan yes, is please. my... Well, you know what's funny? When I need names for a book, I'll, I'll ask, you know, on Facebook, hey, who wants to be in a book? Do you want to volunteer your name? I, I reserve the right to, to make you a jerk or kill you. And it's amazing how many people are like, please kill me in the book. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> really? Anything really? for free. Anything for free. It's so weird. If you want to die on paper, well, okay. <laughs> okay, it's going to be bloody. It's going to be a Here it comes. Mess. It's going to be a weird one, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you. You know, that's what that's what happens. You know, that's, that's yeah. where we're all headed. You know, it's not it's not a good thing. It's not. Yeah. No. Anyway, yeah. well. So it's been. It, you know, you've done it all, Tosca oh. Lee. You, you, and and what did we learn? What did we learn today? Tosca Lee was a dominatrix. She's in the world of play and torture chamber expert. Torture chamber person, yes. Yeah. And, and uh, she really liked Fantasy Island. And I did. I loved it. And 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 now she's writing, and it's it's going well. I yeah, mean. and I don't like writing wars, though. Still don't, and kissing scenes still don't. 
No. Yeah. Well, you know. Killing people is okay, but the kissing stuff is. Well, well just, just just get a co-author to write that. There's there's a lot of good <laughs> good romance authors out well, there. Well, you just, know, in my series with Ted, people would say, "Oh, it's so nice to see Tosca brought the romance to the thing." And I'm like, "I did not write those scenes. I wrote the head chopping ones." Yeah. So, <laughs> that is the truth. <laughs> <laughs> See now, now we've learned something else. She goes to <laughs> she goes to she goes to executions for research, <laughs> and, then, and then has a big lunch afterwards. I do uh, like to eat. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's, the pleasure of being fifty and older is to eat. Yes. Oh, that's my favorite. Right? I mean, what yeah. else is there? It's getting to the mm. point where that's the best thing in life, right? Yep, pretty much. Yeah. That and naps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Eating and sleeping. And I then thought. I take a nap, yeah. Well, we're getting old. <laughs> uh, it sucks. Well, it does. But. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure. And I, you know, oh. we, haven't, we haven't had a dominatrix on the show in, <laughs> in 10 years, so this is great. Yeah. I'm but, so happy to, to be here for you guys. <laughs> yeah, well, this is great. And... Uh, we, of course, we'll have your uh, your website and your dominatrix site up with ours, so people can do one click. You can order a book and maybe, maybe and a whip. A whip. She's she's doing signed whips. Okay. Right. Right. Could you imagine doing a book signing if you get a free whip if they buy two books? <laughs> oh. I bet somewhere it's, it's been done. <laughs> I bet somewhere it's been done. Yeah, well, you're probably right. But, uh, I'm, you know, uh, get Mickey to arrange this. Oh, yeah, great. Poor Mickey. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's my, the guy. My publicist, yeah. yeah. He's the one to do it, I'll tell you. <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure. So, um, thank you. We've been talking with the uh, New York Times bestseller Tosca Lee, and uh, the newest book is called A Single Light, a Thriller, and it's the line between book two. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a, a fun time and pleasure to talk to you guys. Thanks, Tosca. Thank you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.